Well, good morning. This is uh, 11.04 on Thursday, the 24th of August, 2017. It's supposed to be uh, uh, elementary linear algebra class, and right now I'm the only person in the room. So hopefully some more will be coming soon, um, but let's at least for now get started. Now my memory is, and I'm pretty sure I'm correct on this, is that we finished all the preliminary stuff and actually did get started in section 1.1. Okay, so let's continue from there. Um, here is the question. Now, these take a long time to write. Sorry, I don't have PowerPoint, but the book doesn't supply any. So have to write them out. Let me get my pen activated to a darker color. So here we have x minus 2y plus 3z is equal to 9. Minus x plus 3y is equal to negative 4. And 2x minus 5y plus 5z is equal to 17. <clears throat> there is a system of equations, three equations, three unknowns. It should be solvable. However, it may not come out to a single unique solution. Uh, the previous page, but I didn't go over that because I figured you should have had this before, but I'll review a little bit of it now. Anytime you have a system of equations, uh, and it doesn't have to be the same number of equations as you do variables. It doesn't have to have that. This just happens to have. But always there's one of three options. Either it has one single unique solution, x, y, z, that's going to make all three of those correct at the same time. Okay? Or you'll have an infinite number of solutions. In fact, uh, the uh, whatever, usually then you have what they call a parameter, and for a different parameter you get a different set of uh, unique solutions. I mean not unique, you get a different, a different solution, and usually those come in infinite. And there are times when you go to solve something like this, you find like it's completely non-solvable. Now that doesn't mean you, you just don't know how to solve it. It means it has no solution. It can't possibly have a solution. Okay, those are the three cases. If you turn back a page, you'll see those are described somewhat. That's not what we're talking about here, but that's a, a system of equations. Here's another system. Now one thing you'll notice, the first equation is the same. x minus 2y plus 3z is equal to 9. That equation is exactly the same. But now the second equation is a little bit different. It's y plus 3z is equal to 5. And the third equation is simply z is equal to 2. Now that's also what we call a system of three equations with three variables. Now, what you notice here is only the first quest equation really does have three variables. The next, second equation only has two, and the third one has one. And in fact, just looking at it, it's not much of a variable because it's equal to two. That's the only value it can have. Now, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. The book is going to tell you this. These are equivalent systems of equations. That, that means they have exactly, precisely, totally the same solution. And this happens to be a unique solution, uh, one particular point. It makes both of these, the same point makes both of these true. The same value for x, y, and z make both of those true. Okay? Um, so we call these equivalent systems. And it's pretty obvious looking at the second one that you already know one of the components. Z is equal to 2. 
And by plugging z is equal to 2 into the second equation, you'd have y is equal to 3 times 2. I'm sorry. All right. Let's see. I'm not mistaken, and I may be, uh, I thought I saw a couple more people there in the class. Um, but I may be thinking of a different class. So I was thinking of these other ones. I said, wow, I didn't see but one, I mean, two people before. Um, What's that? Yeah, and that's all who I had on roll last time, too, you and Kimmel. Uh, were the only two on the roll, and both of you showed up. But it seemed like, and again, I maybe maybe my eyes were got off line here. But um, I thought there was uh, I saw yesterday when I was just reviewing things. I thought I saw there were four people in the class. I said, "Wow, we doubled." Uh, but I haven't seen anyone show up yet. Okay, where I started talking this time was the top of page. Uh, six, solving a system of linear equations. Now, I don't think we really did. Okay, you tell me. Did we finish talking about syllabus, research paper, and... Uh, um, I, think, I think we have finished about the syllabus. Yeah. Safety part. Okay, so let's hold on this for a minute and go back to safety, okay? Well, we did cover uh, the syllabus, research paper, and my locator card, right? And, and you have to go back to one page. I did not, okay. So let's, uh, yeah. Okay. I hate to do this because when I discard it, I'm going to lose it. Got to be a better way, but I, I don't see it. Let me go down here. Well, I guess I'm going to discard it. Okay. So we did do the research paper, right? Okay. So here's a locator card. And that kind of makes sense because. Uh, I wasn't sure this class was going to make anyway. Now, this is a copy of my locator card. I haven't put it on my door yet, but I will. I, mean, I don't know, but I will at some point. Um, it has on it, of course, um, the, the term, and this is good for the first mini term. I'll show you where the changes will happen in the second mini term, and I'll do a new one. Whether I remember to put it on Blackboard or not, that's a different issue. But I will do one and put it on my door at some point. It has my name, it has my phone number here on the Bachelor campus anyway, and it has my email address. Okay? And here's where I am when um, on campus, when I'm not on campus, when I'm in class, when I'm not in class. All right. My Mondays and Wednesdays, I start the day, I come in usually by 7.45 every morning. Every now and then I won't quite make that. Most of the time, like today, I was there shortly past 7.30. I always shoot to be here by 7.45, and like I say, traffic or other things come up, and I might not make it every day by 7.45, but most of the time I'm a little bit ahead of class. But my classes start across the board Monday through Thursday at 8 o'clock, and on Monday and Wednesday at 8 o'clock, I have a math one in the class, and yesterday, every seat, I brought in chairs, I did everything I could, and every seat was filled. I may have to move the class if more people show up. Okay, so that was uh, Monday and Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Followed by Math 126, Calculus 2, which is a four-hour course that lasts longer, 9.30 to 11.10, and that one I only have two or three students in it, but at least one of them has to have the class to stay on track to graduate on time. And I know what it's like because you got to do Cal 2, then Cal 3, then differential equations, and linear algebra, 
And the only way he'll be able to to graduate and transfer on time is if he has one twenty six to spend. So he wants to do two twenty seven in the spring and then linear algebra and differential equations in the summer. He can't do it any other way. So so he's I'm teaching this from going to a couple of schools. Okay? Uh, it goes to eleven ten. I usually don't get down to my office before eleven fifteen. Uh, but sometime after that, I go and try to grab a little bite of lunch. Okay? Uh, but I'm in the office and if I usually bring them out flat. I usually eat in my office, and most of the time I'm in there, so you can contact me there too. Then at 12.15, I have Cal 3. On that one, I think I have three students or so in that one. And at least one of them has to have it to graduate. Okay? I think he is graduating this term and has to have it, so we know he doesn't have any options. So that's the Cal 3. And then followed by differential equations at 2 o'clock. And by the way, this is 1215 to 155. That's another four hour course. So uh, differential equations is 2 to, you're in that one, right? No. Yeah, I know. Cal 3. Cal 3. So yeah, you know that. Okay. And differential equations then is uh, 2 to 315. And there's a, one guy who is graduating this term. Okay. And that leads to my only office hours to speak of on Monday and Wednesday. In fact, the biggest chunk I have on the Bachelor campus is Monday and Wednesday, 3 15 to 5 15. Now, most days I'm probably going to be here past 5 15. I'm really not even supposed to be here that long, but I've got to have some office hours to get ready for the next day and the rest of the week. So that's my biggest chunk of office hours. Okay, let's go back to Tuesday, Thursday then. All right, that's today. And like Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, I start in the morning with a huge Math 112 class. Today I think I have three seats left. Um, so that's a big class, followed by 113. And that, when I think I have 15 to 18 students, I haven't seen the latest one. There's something wrong with that one. And then this is our class now. And then right after this, we finish at 1, uh, 12 15. And at 1 15, I've got my uh, physical science. So that's the only time I've got to eat lunch. But again, I'll bring my lunch. I usually eat in my office, so that's what I'll do. Now, first many term, then let's talk about physical science 111. Uh, because it's a mini term course, it goes from 115 to 345. That's the class part. Now, I don't always do it this way, but, but that's what is allowed for class. And then 315 to 5, I mean, 345 to 545 is lab. Okay? Both days. Mini term classes with labs, they eat up the whole afternoon. So from 115 to 545. Hide up to that. And so, therefore, hopefully by 6 o'clock, I'll be able to just shove off. Because whatever we're doing, it usually takes me a few minutes and then we get things ready for the next day. Uh, but I try to leave by 6. Seldom do I get away by 6. Okay? Now, before we leave this place, let me tell you what's going to happen second in the term. I'm through with math, physical science 111, did physical science 112. However, the, the whole reason I even offer a science course on many terms is the automotive program has to have it there. Okay? Uh, we have a very good, big, well-respected automotive program. One of the things that makes them so special, the first year students are in school the first half, the first eight weeks, and they're on dealerships the second eight weeks. And then the second year students are on dealership the first eight weeks and in class the second eight weeks. So second mini term, the students, the second year students will be coming back, and some of them, I think it's GM and possibly Toyota students, want to take the physical science 112 there. Not a super convenient for me because they are in their automotive classes until three o'clock. So I can't start physical science 112 until 315. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, this will slide down to start at 315 rather than 115, which 
which will give me office hours in between 1.15 and 2.15. That would be nice to have some office hours built in. But what's not so nice, it leaves me leaving campus at 8 o'clock rather than 6 o'clock. So, uh, give and take. So, uh, anyway, that's what happens in the interim. I'll try to get this a new locator card done, post it on my door, whether I remember to put it in Blackboard, I don't know, but you've heard about it. Okay, and then on Fridays, I'm on the Birmingham campus most Fridays, and usually there from 7.45 until 11.45. Most of the time I'm there after 11.45 that night. Uh, and that's on Birmingham campus, academic building, B122, like great suite of offices, and I'm in the copy room behind the second desk, the second desk. I'm there. Now, they love calling meetings on Fridays, so I know that usually one or two Fridays a month I'm going to be in a meeting. And a lot of times they don't tell us which Friday it is until Thursday. So I may not know when we're in class that I won't be in, in the office the full time. But I'll be there. They never call them super early, so I'll be there at sub 45 until usually 9 or something like that. But this Friday, I don't know of any meetings, so hopefully that won't happen. I'll be there the whole time. Uh, put down a lunch here just because it requires to put down a lunch side. Uh, I don't do a full lunch usually. I usually just bring a snack or something like that. And I'm still working in the office. Okay. And then I'm usually not off campus, but I feel like it's really fine to put that down. All right, any questions on where I am, when I am? Okay. So I think I'm through with that then, so let's get rid of that. And the other thing was safety, right? All right. So let's talk about safety. Did we talk about it in the other class? You've already heard it all, right? And the trouble is, Trimble wasn't in the other class. So let's just wait till he comes, whenever he gets here, and remind me, and we'll have a time out and do safety then. Because you've already heard it, but he hasn't. And it'll probably be better for him to do it in person when I can point to things on the thing. Even when I'm back there talking, I'm not sure my microphone pick, picks it up. So we'll just hold off. Okay. Now we're ready to get back to what we were doing. And unfortunately, I lost everything I wrote. And you don't have a book either, do you? Yeah, okay. Basically, what I had written down was two systems of equations. Three equations, three unknowns. The first one, do you remember it that was up there? It was pretty big and only a few holes in it. The second one, uh, the third equation was just z is equal to 2, which is an equation, but that then you can use in the second equation to back substitute and find out what y is, and then you can put those two values in the first equation and figure out what x is. Whereas the next, the, the first one I had there, it almost looks like a mystery. I mean, where do you even begin? Well, that's what this course is about. Where do we begin? And then what I was saying is those two systems were equivalent systems. They had the same solution. Which one was easier to solve? The second one, big time. You could just look at it almost and figure out what it was. So what we're going to do is a much easier system now and solve this. Uh, and by the way, you remember? I better write it. Okay. I'm going to write the second one again. X, oh, yuck. Wait. Okay. X minus 2Y plus 3Z is equal to 9. Y plus 3Z is equal to 5 and z is equal to 2. Okay? Now they have a special name for this one. The other one, remember, had x's in all three equations. I think it was missing a y in the second equation, but it had one in the z, and it had uh, one in the third equation. It had z's in all three equations, it had numbers in all three equations. 
didn't look at all like that except the first equation was identical. Okay? That was just three equations, three unknowns. This is three equations, three unknowns. As I said before, an equivalent e set of equations, exactly the same solution, but this form that you see here is called a row equivalent, I'm sorry, row echelon form. And what a row echelon form means is the, here are the two or three features of a row echelon form. The first non-zero entry in the first equation, the coefficient is one. And then whatever you have for the rest of it is seven. The first non-zero entry in the second equation, see this is a zero entry. That coefficient is 1. Okay? And the first non zero entry in the third equation, this coefficient is 1. Okay? So that's one feature. The first non zero entry in each row has a coefficient of 1. The second feature is that these leading terms stack down. The uh, stair step down, something like that. In other words, this one will be wherever it is. The second one will be somewhere to the right of that one. Maybe two or three faces to the right, but it'll be somewhere to the right of that one. The next one's going to be somewhere to the right of that one. Okay? So that's what we mean by row echelon form. Two features leading coefficients to the first non zero entry in each row is one. And those leading terms and those step to the right as you go down. At least one unit, maybe two. What's that? Uh, R O W, as in the rows of the equation, hyphenated E C H E L O N, row echelon. And what? That term, I don't think I ever use echelon anywhere else except in linear algebra. But where they came up with it, I do not know. Okay. Now we're going to do a very simple equation that's already in row echelon form. X minus 2Y is equal to 5. Now, by the way, if you have one equation with two variables, you'll never have a unique solution. Ever. Well, yeah, ever. If you have one equation, two variables. Because guess what? Give me a y, any y you want to. One, okay? So x minus 2, 2 times 1 is 2. x minus 2 is equal to 5, x is equal to 7. Okay? Give me another y. 3. X minus 6 is equal to 5. X is equal to 11. You have an infinite number of solutions. Any Y you choose, I'll give you a different X. Uh, I'll give you an X. Okay? And it will be a different X, by the way. So that will never have a unique solution that has an infinite number of solutions. But two equations, two equations with two variables may give you a unique solution. This one happens, we'll see y is equal to negative uh, 2. Now, question to you, is that in row echelon form? Yes. Because the leading coefficient of, of every term, leading non-zero entry in each row, is the coefficient of 1. And the ones, those leading coefficients step to the right. Okay? Can you solve that for me? Right. Okay. One. Got it. There's your solution. Ordered pair, one, negative two. That's the one and only ordered pair that solves both of those solutions. Certainly, y is equal to negative two. That solves the last one. That's pretty clear. And this one is one plus four is equal to five. Only ordered pair you'll find 
that solves those two equations. Okay? Now, let's do the one, this one that we have up here. I believe that's the same one. Yes, it is. So what would that solution be? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. No, X. X. So it'd be X plus H equal nine. X equal one. All right. That is a unique solution. And that unique solution is 1, minus 1, 2. Uh, I'm sort of a skeptic. I want to make sure I didn't make any dumb mistakes. So I'm going to plug those in and see if we get it to work. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 6 is 9. Yeah, we know that. Next one is minus 1 plus 6. Square it up is 5. It's is equal to 3. Yep. Now, not only is that a solution, it's the only solution, unique solution. Okay. Now, this is what I was saying before. Two systems of linear equations are equivalent if they have the same solution set. Exactly, identically the same solutions. To solve a system that is not in row echelon form, we first convert it to an equivalent system that is in row echelon form, and then we have a very easy way to solve the problem, relatively easy anyway. And the guy who came up with this was a guy named Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was, he has many uh, titles, I think, German mathematician, uh, recognized with Newton and Archimedes, that's pretty lofty company, as one of the three greatest mathematicians in history. Isaac Newton, Archimedes, and Carl Friedrich Gauss. Now, actually, the other two probably are a bit better known, but nobody was really much brighter in math than, than Gauss. Um, he solved equations using this, and now, therefore, we call this Gaussian elimination. Back substitution, Gaussian elimination, those are used almost interchangeably. Um, now, did he actually invent it? He, he did, but he wasn't the first to do so. The Chinese have been using it. Uh, but some 2,000 years before Gauss said Chinese were pretty bright. Okay. And I don't know if we even know. They may know who first came up with it. That was so thinking long ago. Who knows if they recorded it. Now, <clears throat> so what the deal is, is to get from a complicated set of equations to row echelon form. And once you get it in that form, it's easy to solve, okay? So here are the rules that you can do uh, operations that produce equivalent systems. These are the allowable operations. Each of the following operations on a system of linear equation produces an equivalent system. So here's the first thing you can do. Let's just mentally picture you have a set of, say, three equations, three unknowns. Okay? One thing that you can always do anytime you want to is interchange any two rows. You haven't changed the system at all, you just change the order. So that's one thing you can always do, interchange any two equations. So 
it is an equivalent system the thing that you started with. That's why you do it. So, you see, to be equivalent means it has the same solution. So if you do just these three steps, now you can do some of them repeatedly, but just using these three steps, you can go from a complicated form to row echelon form. And you know those are equivalent systems, so whatever your solution this is, you don't need a solution of that. Okay? That's the procedure. The first of these is interchange any two equations. Okay? Second thing you can always do. You can multiply uh, any equation by a non-zero constant. Okay. Multiply any equation by a non-zero constant. We don't go along multiplying by zero. Okay, that wipes out all the meaning and you lose whatever that value that, that equation has. So as long as it's not zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, we almost always think of whole numbers. Negative 3, 14, you know, whatever. But you also think of this. Any non-zero constant, 1 over 4, minus, two, uh, minus 1 over 7, you know, any non-zero constant you can multiply with. So that's another, as long as you multiply both sides of the equation, every term on both sides of the equation by that. Okay? Now here's the one you may not realize you can do, but you can. Add... A multiple of one equation to another equation. Okay. Add a multiple of one equation to another equation. I don't know if it was a mistake or not, but in between classes I was so hungry. I ate a granola bar, and now my throat is so dry I can hardly talk. I should have gotten more water after I did it, so hopefully I can make it because you don't have that much longer to go. Ah! Okay. Uh, now, using just these three steps, you can go from a system of equations that may be fairly complicated looking, and as long as you do them judiciously, but it may take several, several steps to do so, you can get it down to row echelon form. Once you get in row echelon form, piece of cake to solve it. Maybe a big piece of cake, but it is a piece of cake. Okay. Now, uh, rewriting a system of equations in row echelon form usually involves a chain of equivalent systems each of which is obtained by using one of those three basic operations. That process is called Gaussian elimination after call Friedrich Gauss, that we mentioned before. Okay, and by the way, he was active in so many areas, not just linear algebra, calculus, physics, I mean, magnetism. Uh, you just name it, he was involved with. In fact, the unit for magnetic field was originally the Gauss, a Gauss, you know. And it's not the SI unit for a magnetic field. That is now the Tesla, which was named after somebody else. Uh, but the Gauss was the one that was used way before Tesla came about being. See, originally the um, we called it the metric system, and everything was just metric, you know. But then, um, especially because of I was thinking of this yesterday, um, when it got to I don't know exactly when it happened. 
But the one big change, but this is one too, is that, okay, a meter is a pretty good distance. A gram is a very small mass. In a second, it's a second, okay? Uh, so what they did, they went from going from um, they decided since meter is pretty large anything that had those kinds of dimensions usually going to be way bigger than a little gram so they started using the kilogram as the basic unit of mass not the gram kilogram this book would probably be between one and two kilograms whereas a gram would be less than the mass of this that's hollow you know more like maybe an aspirin tablet or something like that maybe two that would be about a, a gram so a gram was just way small for such a big unit like a meter so they went to kilograms because kilograms and meters yeah well they named that then the si units system international uh, whereas technically metric would be a few grams or whatever so now back when i was first taking physics many years ago the metric was just sort of getting into vogue then and they actually had two systems and we had to learn both systems in fact it made i would say the teaching and learning of calculus way more complicated than it needed to be okay because they use for small measurements, like if you're measuring something uh, not necessarily microscopic, but just a small amount of something, they use what they call the CGS system. That's centimeters. Centimeters is about the width of your little fingernail. Gram, that's a tiny amount of mass. Second, that's all you have time. Or they use the... Uh, MKS system, meter, kilogram, kilogram, second. Okay. So when I was first, and then of course we had the English system, which is feet, uh, I don't think they. Well, there is a unit name for it, but no one ever uses it. Uh, for mass, it's a slug. No one ever uses that. But that would be the foot slug second system. That was so bizarre we, we didn't use it. But, uh, but, I mean, we were used to using it, but we never measured it in slugs. We measured it in pounds. The pound doesn't measure mass. It measures force. So, so. That done, we're going to use these three operations to work on example seven. Okay. Here's example seven. Solve the system. Oh boy, this looks pretty familiar. That's the one we started with. X minus 2y plus 3z is equal to 9. Minus x plus 3y is equal to negative 4. Goodness gracious. 2x minus 5y my, uh, plus, three, plus 5z Goodness gracious, this keeps doing that. C is equal to 17. Okay. What's that? Z, that's the Z. Okay. Uh, my writing is usually sort of bad. 
ionizing pins make it worse, and then have a floppy screen make it even worse. So I have lots of excuses. But. All right. Now we want to get this in row echelon form. Tell me the features of row echelon form. Yes, yes. So this is the bill, these can be mine, okay? Or it's another one. Okay, no, well, you do equivalent things to it. The leading term in each non zero term in each equation steps over one. So we want to get rid of this and we want to get rid of that. So we've got a, a one here, that's good. And we want to get rid of that thing. Now remember what were the three things we could do. Exchange two rows, multiply by a constant, non-zero constant, or add some multiple of one row to another row. Well, look at here. If you add the first row to the second row, what happens to your leading term? It goes to zero. So that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to uh, row. The, okay. I'm sort of already getting into what we call. Okay. Equation one plus equation two becomes the new equation two. Okay. We're just going to add them together, and they're still going to be true. So since we're using the first one, we're going to write it down. x minus 2y plus 3z is equal to 9. Okay? Now do what we just said there. Add the first two rows together and make that the new second row. What does this give us? 0. Okay? Add those two together, and you get? Y. Add those two together and you get? Huh? Plus 3Z. And that's equal to? 5. Okay? What's that again? Yeah, 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 exactly, got it. Yeah, you want this to become a zero. How do you make that become a zero? Add those two together and that becomes a zero. But if you add these two, you have to add all the pairs. So that makes the y, 3z, equal 5. Okay. Now, that is really nice because not only did you make this a zero, you got this coefficient to be 1. Ha! Nice, really nice. Okay? But you also need that to become zero. Okay? Now here you just could add these two and it became a zero. But remember the rule says you can add a multiple of one row to another row and get it. Then you have equivalent. So what multiple could you what can you multiply by this to add to that to make this place a zero? Negative two. Right. Okay, so that's gonna be the next step we do. Negative 2 times equation 1 plus equation 3 is going to become the new equation 3. So let's do that. And we'll do it term at a time. Two times, or negative 2 times x is? 3. Negative 2x plus 2x, that's 0. Fine and dandy. I like it. Okay. But we got to do all of them that way. That would be negative, no, positive. Negative 2 times negative 2. No, positive 4. Negative times that. Positive 4y minus 5y is you see you're doing minus 2 times this that would be 
plus 4 minus 5 is negative 1. Okay. So this will be minus y. Okay? Let's go to the third term. Negative 2 times 3 is? Negative 6. Negative 6. Negative times 5 is negative, right? So negative 6z plus 5t. It's what? Negative z. Okay. So it'll be a minus z. Okay, and do it to the constant terms too. Negative 2 times 9 plus 17, negative 1. So that's equal to negative 1. All right, let's go back and check. These are equivalent systems because these were the rules gave you equivalent equations. Okay, so we got our leading one here. First on zero, leading one there. Uh, but we need this to become a No, you want it to become a zero. You want it to scalp down, remember? And this oh, other scalp. Okay. So you want that to become a zero. Okay. And how do we get that to become a zero? No, how about just adding? Yeah, just add. So E2 plus E3 becomes the new E3. That'll be an equivalent equation. So this becomes, you aren't using the first term, so just write it down. X minus 2Y plus 3Z is equal to 9. And you're using the second equation but not changing it, so that stays the same. Y plus 3Z is equal to 5. Now let's do what we just said to the third equation. And what does that become? Two Z is equal to four. Okay? Now let's go back and review. We sure have it close to row echelon form. What I mean close is the steps what is the first, second, third? So stepping to the right, each term, one thing that does it keeps it from being low echelon form. What is that? Yeah, there's two in front of the Z. So what was that third thing? Remember, there are three things we could do to an equation. Exchange them. We didn't have to exchange any here. And the third one was add a multiple of one to another. We've been doing that. What was the second? Any equation by a non-zero number. Can you think of a non-zero number we can multiply this by to make that a one? A two, two multiply the right and give you four. What can you multiply? Huh? To make it a one. To make it a one. One half, exactly. Which is also dividing by two. So you can say multiply or divide by a non-zero number if you prefer that. I like to say divide, but they say multiply the and you can never divide by zero, so that's why you don't want to divide by zero either. Okay, yeah, divide both of these by two. You have to do the whole equation, so this becomes c is equal to two. And guess what this is? Row echelon form and turn back a page or something, and you'll see that's exactly the example six equation. That's exactly the one we started out with at the top. So you see these are equivalent equations. This one started out on the top of the previous page. We've done all of our row operations and wound up with the second one at the top. So they are equivalent systems. So guess what? You don't have to go back and solve it. We've already solved that. Z is equal to 2. Y was equal to what? Negative 1. 
and x was equal to plus 1, right? Yeah. So we already had this solved. 1, negative 1, 2. Now, they show a picture in the book that I'm glad I didn't have to draw, but it's, I guess, correct and accurate, but boy, it takes a lot of looking to see this. Each one of these equations, you can either use this one or that one, represents a point. I don't know which one. So one of them is this purple plane that goes like this, one of them is the green plane that goes like that, and one of them is the pink plane that goes like this, and the one and only one point they have in common is one, negative one, two. Now the way they drew it, it makes it look like you almost have a line there. If that had come out on the line there, then you would have an infinite number of solutions. Okay? But, uh, you came out with exactly one. Okay. Now, how would it look if there were no solutions? That means one plane would be here, one plane would be here, and one plane would be there. Okay. Or, and this is when you get the planes, it really gets weird. One plane here, another plane here, and another plane there. There's no, there's lots of places where two of those are solved but no place where all three of them are solved. So you can have all sorts of weird geometric stuff where no solutions occur. But certainly the parallel ones, that would be no solutions. Okay. Now. Combined with what we did before we came up with a solution, x equal 1, y equal negative 1, z is equal to 2. Or you could write it as 1, negative 1, 2. Or to triple it. However you want to do that. Because there were a lot of steps in there that we did, never a bad idea to go back and check. So let's just sort of do that quickly here. Um, I'm sort of tempted to do it down there so you can sort of follow what I'm doing, but I only have one marker here, I have two hands, so let's do it this way. It would be 1 plus 2 is 3 plus 6 is equal to 9. Sure enough, that works. Okay, let's do the next one. Yes. Sure enough, that works. Okay, the third one, two, seven, seventy, perfect. Okay, usually a pretty good idea to do that. Since you had so many steps, you want to make sure you've got it right. Okay, now let's do another example. Here we have, for some reason, my cord is, well, I know part of the reason it is. I'll deal with that later. Okay. X, 1, minus 3X, 2, plus X, 3, is equal to negative 1. No, it's equal to plus 1. Sorry. 2X, 1. Minus x2 minus 2x3 is equal to 2. And x1 plus 2x2 minus 3x3 is equal to negative 1. Okay, make sure I copied that right. Uh, by the way, since I'm left-handed, if, if, if it was a perfect world, I would have the computer over here and my book over there and it would be much easier to write. 
wouldn't be doing this all the time. But they put the plug here, and it's a short cord. I have no option but to put that there. I can't have it here, otherwise I get tangled up and fall down. All right. What we want to do is solve that system. How would we go about doing it? Okay, well, number one, we start off with looking and saying we want our first coefficient, non-zero coefficient, to be one. We got it. It's already done for us. Now, yes. if these two have been swapped, that would be the same system, right? But then rather than dividing by two, it's easier to swap the two. But they already had it for us, so we don't have to. Or we could have swapped these two also because this all already has one. And since it's already there, I'm going to change it. Okay? So yeah, we got that. So what do we want to happen next? This becomes a... No, it's not a one. No, we want it to be a zero. So how do we get it to become a zero? this by negative 2 and add to that. That'll work on it. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Negative 2 E1 plus E2 becomes a new E2. E standing for equation. All right, so we're using that first row, so let's write it down. X1 minus 3X2 plus x3 is equal to 1. All right? Do what it just directed you, us to. Right? And add it to the second equation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that'll be 5x2. Perfect. Next. Okay. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Oh, oh you are on it. I added. Okay, good. Minus 4x3. I'm sorry, you were ahead of me. Okay? That's what you meant? Yeah. Okay? Next. Zero. That's legal. That's fine. Okay? What do you want to happen next? Say again? How? Okay. Do the top one by negative 1 and add. You see? Okay. So minus E1 plus E3 becomes the new E3. Now here's here's sort of the deal with it. Now, a couple of things. Remember, we want that leading coefficient to be a one. Once you have it being a one, then to get rid of this one, you just multiply that one by the opposite of this number, negative two. You get this to be a zero, multiply that one by the opposite of this number, which is negative one. So as long as you have that leading, the one you're working with is a 1, it's real easy to pick out what you multiply by. Right? All right, so let's do that then. What does that give us? Okay, it becomes a 0. If 
5x2. Okay. Is what? Yeah, negative 4x3. What's that again? Negative 3. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Because negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. It's negative one. That's negative two. You're right. Negative two. I've, I've jumped over the wrong one. Okay. All right. Now, <laughs> does anything look suspicious here? Same thing on the left equal different things on the right. I don't think that happens too frequently, does it? Another way you could do this is, and this we normally wouldn't do it this way, but this time I would. You can multiply the top of the negative to top plus the bottom. It makes a new box. Okay? Negative e2. Plus e3 is a good move. Okay? So it'd be minus 5 plus 5 would be 0. Plus 4 minus 4 would be 0. 0 minus 2 would be minus 2. So you have 0 is equal to minus 2. When does that happen? Nothing. If you, if you get something like this that can never be true, you have no solutions. And what they said here, this example was an inconsistent system, meaning it has no solutions. So, backing up a little bit, the ones we did before that gave you a single point for a solution, those were called consistent systems, meaning they have a solution. Now, if that solution happened to be an infinite number of points, it's still consistent. But if you have no solutions, you can't possibly have 0 equal negative 2, then that's an inconsistent system. There are no solutions. Okay. Now, let's go back to the ones when we talked about getting a whole line of solutions, infinite number of solutions. That's consistent, but then those two equations are dependent on each other, meaning they are the same line. Okay. So, those are a couple of other terms we can refer to. And that's why they call this an inconsistent system. All right. Let's do another. Come this out. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we've got to. 12.15, don't we? Yeah. So we've just got a few minutes. Here's another system x2 minus x3 is equal to 0. x1 minus 3x3 is equal to negative 1. minus x1 plus 3x2 is equal to 1. Okay. Goodness gracious, my head. All right. In order to solve the system, we need to get it in what form? Um, row echelon form. What are some of the characteristics of row echelon form? The first coefficient of each row to be 
first non-zero coefficient should be a 1, and that first one up there is a 1, okay? In each row, well, the third row is not. What's the other feature? Yeah, stair step downward. This one is stepping in the wrong direction. So what's one of the legitimate things we can do to make that step right? Exchange the two rows. So we're just going to flip those two rows, or equations, okay? And I'm just going to do it this way. I'm just going to do that symbol there to say flip them. So this produces uh, x1 minus 3x3 is equal to minus 1 x2 minus x3 is equal to 0 and minus x1 plus 3x2 is equal to 1. All right. What do we want to happen next? equation what about it you probably said it right but I'm so hard to hear okay what do we want to do really zero and how could we make that become zero Add the first and the third. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. So here we'll say E1 plus E3 is the new E3. Okay. So that will come down here. And we're using E1. So just write it down. X1 minus 3X3 equal negative 1. We're not using 2 yet. So just have X2 minus x3 is equal to 0. Alright, let's do the operation you just told me. 0, got it. Yes, 3x2, okay, minus 3x3 is equal to 0, okay, say again, 0, okay, having trouble hearing. <clears throat> I'm having trouble focusing too because my head's hurting. Okay. So, what do we want to happen next? We've got a 1 here. And basically, here's how we're going to talk about zeros below. Okay. And you got a 1 there. And you want 0 below. So, how do we get this to become a 0? Second equation by negative 3 and add to the third. So that will be minus 3e2 plus e3 becomes a new e3. Okay. We're using the, not using the top equation at all, so just write it down. x1 minus 3x3 is equal to minus 1. The second one is x2 minus x3 is equal to 0. 
Okay. Now our new third equation will be Yeah, I can go to zero, right? Okay, that would be zero as well. And, and that's equal to zero. Okay, guess what that tells you? When is zero equal to zero? Always! Okay, so what this means is you have an infinite number of solutions because that's always true. What's that? It's consistent because you have an infinite number of solutions, but then we say it's the equations are dependent on each other. Whereas when you had one unique solution, it was consistent, but the equations were independent of each other. This one, they're dependent. Now, how you can still get a solution, you see, you can come up with a value for x1. Okay? And x2 can't come up with anything for x3. Okay? So therefore we set x3 to be some parameter. Okay? And the book likes to use t. So we say let x3 equal t. Okay? Now, From the second equation, here's where we're back substituting, but now we're putting t in for x3. x2 minus t is equal to 0, which implies that x2 is also equal to t. Right? And do the same thing for the first equation, and we have x1. minus 3 uh, yeah goodness gracious minus 3 times t yeah minus 3 times t is equal to negative 1 okay which implies that x1 is equal to 3t minus 1. So guess what we've got? Here's an ordered triplet. 3t minus 1, comma, t, comma, t. Give me a t. Any t. Make up one. 1, okay? Then this will be 2, 1, 1. All right, give me another t. 5. This will be 14 by 5. Give me another t. Zero. This will be minus 1, 0, 0. Okay? All of those should fit that system of equations. They all should make come out being a solution. That means you have an infinite number of solutions. As many choices as you have of t, you have that many solutions. So that's what we mean by an infinite number of solutions. Well, let's make sure we got it right. Yeah, we got x1 equal 3t minus 1, uh, x2 is equal to t, x3 is equal to t. So you decide, you put the t in the equation, not the t in the answer? So, yeah, when, when you come up with a um, something that's always true, but you can't solve for this, mm -hmm. then just give that a, a parameter. T, S, R, those are the paper ones. And then plug that in, and then solve for X2 and solve for X1. You may have some that have four, five, six variables and not enough equations, so you might have a T, an S, an R, and a P, you know, so you just put them all in. The ones that have the leading ones, you can solve for those. The ones that don't have the leading ones, you have to put forever. 
All right, good deal. I think next time we will start with the discovery at the bottom of page nine. So I'll leave that. What's that? Yeah, it's section 1.1. Chapter 1, section 1.1. And we are, when we do that one discovery, and by the way, let me go, do you have access to a book or anything? I'll do, I'll do it. What's that? Oh, you will. Okay. Well, on homework exercises 1.1, because the, okay, now, this is something about this author which I really, really, really like. Okay, number one, most books have answers for some problems in the back. This one does two odd number exercises in the back. But not only that, but on every exercise set, you'll see, see www calcheck.com will work out to as you see the odd number prop exercises. So if you'll just write that down, www. and I don't think it matters on capitalization, capitalization but it's C-A-L-C, as in calculator, C-A-L-C, C-H-A-T, like chat, chatting, calcheck.com, you can get workout solutions for every problem in the book. Okay? Uh, so, I will tell you, do any of the odds, one through five, you don't have to do them all, but if you want to, you could. Any of the odds, either seven or nine, or both if you want. Any of the odds, 11 through 23. Any of the odds, 25 to 29. Any of the odds, 31 to 35. And any of the odds 37 to 55. Again, you don't have to do them all, but do some of each. Uh, and it says here you might need a graphing calculator or something for this. Try doing either 57 or 59. If it gets way too complicated, you don't have to do that. Okay? Uh, then do either 61 uh, sorry, or 63. Uh, you can try number 65, and then 67 is a true-false. I would definitely read through that and figure out whether you think it's true or false, and then check the back and see if you got the right answers. Uh, you can do the same type thing with 69. Whoa, there's more. Uh, 71 or 75. Sorry, 71 or 73, I think. My eyes are playing tricks on me. I'm having trouble focusing. They're kind of strobing a little bit like a, not quite like a migraine, but sort of. Try number 75, and try any of the odds 77 through 81. You can look at 85, there's not really much to do with that, uh, and or 87. And or 89, and or 91. Okay. And again, that's all the homework exercises there. All we have to do left in this section is a discovery. So we'll do the little discovery and then move on from there. Okay. All right. Let me close it.